Okay. So it is 6.30 um, European time um, and another time anywhere in the world. So we are very happy. My name is Alberto Breda. I'm uh, uh, the president of the European uh, section of robotic surgery. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to this webinar on robotic radical prostatectomy. We now have uh, uh, with us uh, tremendous speakers uh, and the amount of uh, audience that we have here, over 900 people registered, uh, I think is uh, thanks to uh, these excellent speakers we have. Let me introduce you to Professor Patel, to Professor Jihad Kauk and Professor Bernardo Rocco and myself, um, who will give you some insight uh, into the experience we had over the years uh, on robotic radical prostatectomy. We have a little change in the program because uh, 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 Professor Patel has to leave earlier today, unfortunately. So we'll have uh, number one, uh, Professor Patel giving us uh, his lecture on the evolution of uh, robotic prostatectomy with his experience with over 16,000 cases performed. And after his talk, we'll have the question and answers. So, so we will be able to have probably, hopefully three, four minutes uh, dedicated to him. Then we'll have uh, Professor Kauk uh, telling us some uh, secrets on the single port. Then we'll have my talk on the Hugo system and finally Bernardo Rocco. So please, without uh, saying any more words, um, please, uh, uh, Vip, start with your beautiful lecture. We're eager to hear what you have to tell us. Great, thank you, Alberto. Uh, thank you to the AU for allowing us to uh, give this uh, presentation. Uh, and I'm going to just speak today a little bit about uh, my experience in robotic prostatectomy. So hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, I'm going to basically speak about the evolution uh, of my experience. It's been almost 21 years now. And so uh, we've done quite a few prostatectomies in that time. And the way I wanted to look at this lecture was past, present and future, you know, what led us to having to evolve from the initial robotic prostatectomies we were doing? How did we evolve? What techniques did we change? And then what needs to happen in the future so that we could continue to deliver good outcomes? And I think the beginning is, is, is clear. You know, you have to know how you're doing uh, and collect your data in order to actually enforce outcomes and change things positively. I think uh, the best thing we did is from the beginning, we had a very strong database and quarterly we look at the outcomes and we do retrospective and introspective analysis and we publish our outcomes and i think this has been the key <clears throat> to this lecture and the evolution of what we see so you know what led to change and i think really if i look back over these 20 plus years the biggest change has been the oncology of the patients we are seeing you know we've gone through many changes, you know, the beginning of my series started kind of in the early 2000s, you know, during the quote Walsh era of, you know, early lower risk tumors mainly getting operated, but things have changed. And as you can see here over the years, the increased uh, high risk, increased extracapsular disease has led to a change in the patients that we're seeing. So, how did we change? What did we change? These are some of the things that we've published on. And all of this is looking at the complications, the margins, the trifecta, pentafecta outcomes. This is how we enact change. It's evidence-based and sometimes prospective, uh, but we always look retrospective at what has already happened. So as we look at certain things, you know, let me go back one here. Continence, one of the most important factors for patients. Um, I think nurse bearing is important. Uh, when you do a full nurse bearing versus a wider resection, continence is affected. The urethral length, the quality, robustness of the urethra, being uh, very careful and minimizing tissue damage and doing a good anastomosis and then rehab after is all important for continence. So what did we do? Um, I always like to reconstruct the bladder neck to make it just a little bit bigger than the urethra. This allows me to get my catheters out at day four or day five. And I think it helps everything heal faster. Um, the posterior reconstruction, the Rocco stitch, uh, Bernardo was our fellow 
uh, many years ago, and we worked on this technique together. We still use it today. And in the middle there, you have the suspension stitch. And we showed good data showing improvement in early continents using this, but this stitch specifically we've had to take out and then not use, not because we didn't think it was effective, but because once again, what enforced change for us was the oncology. We started to use MRI. We started to see more anterior tumors. We started to see more apical tumors. So putting this stitch at the apex there early in the case was a problem because we couldn't get a good view of the apex. And so we now actually do something different. We do a modified apical uh, dissection where we actually cut through the dorsal venous complex first, pull out the, the prostate, and enlarge and enhance the urethra, and then we suture. So we don't put that early stitch anymore. And once again, it was all <clears throat> based on the changing oncology that we were seeing. And so now we prefer to have this kind of view where we see the apex really well. We see the vessels, we see the sphincter area, and then we have a cleaner cut of the urethra. So oncologically, anterior and apical tumors kind of force this change on us. Posterior reconstruction, we just talked about it. We've done this probably for you know, 14, 15,000 cases, and we like it for the continents, but also for the hemostasis. The thing that's probably changed the most during my time, I would say, is the um, nerve sparing. And the reason the nerve sparing, I think, has changed the most is because of the fact that, the, once again, the tumors change, but also technique and the robot. You know, the robot is better now than it was when we started in 2002. Our technique has obviously improved, but the oncology has changed to kind of counterbalance that. So when we look at nerve sparing, um, these are the things I think are important. You know, preserve the whole bundle from apex to base. Do a retrograde nerve sparing. I'll show a video on that in a second. Preserve all the accessory pudendal structures. Uh, preserve the fascial attachments and minimize coagulation and neuropraxia. So the key in nerve sparing, minimize the trauma in the best we can. This is a patient you can see has two huge accessory pudendals. There's his nerve bundles down there. And I think when you see these large pudendal vessels, you have to save them because then if you don't, you have a potential of getting vasculogenic impotence and the nerve sparing doesn't help you. So you have to do a good nerve sparing on these patients, but you also have to save the accessory pudendal vessels. Very, very important. Retrograde nerve sparing. I think many of you have seen it. Many of you have seen us do it. Um, the reason it's important is at the base of the prostate where the pedicle comes in, the nerve bundle is extremely close to the, to the, to the base. And so really the only way I see to do a clean nerve spare is to first release the nerve and then under vision, actually place that clip. And so very important to have good vision. And I think when you do a retrograde nerve spare, you really do kind of get the cleanest look at the base of the prostate. And you can judge whether you're doing a full or a partial. You want to have the base vision and the cleanest planes of section. And you can see here that nerve has been fully preserved. At the end, this is what we like to see, or we did like to see in many. Um, the train tracks, as we call them, the nerves have been spared, the urethra looks good. This is kind of our optimal. We have published some recent things on changes, um, modifying the lateral prostatic fascia dissection. And the reason we've done that is in certain patients, certain patients who are very low risk, you can actually do a more enhanced nerve sparing than the one I just showed where well, you leave the lateral prostatic fascia in place and you're actually inside that plane and therefore you don't even see the nerve bundles. They're buried behind the fascia and that's what I'll show you here. So here we're 30 down, now going to 30 up. I like to do my nerve spurrings from below and here we're just going to push the tissue away. You can see we're using the Da Vinci XI. We have very good vision and you can see there's a nice layer between prostate and the fascia on the prostate and the nerve bundle. You can actually get in this sweet plane. There's no arteries crossing here. There's just some venous branches, but this is what you want to see. And we're probably about a third of the way up the prostate. 
I'll do the same on the other side. And then what we'll do is let me move forward. We'll connect, we'll go anterior and we'll connect the two. So here's the posterior dissection. And now let me show you the anterior dissection as well. So here. So here we're going anterior. So also here on the right side, you can see we're quite close to the prostate. So this is very selective in low risk patients, young guys where potency is important. You don't want to get in the capsule, but you can get in the fascial layer right there. And so this is a retrograde nerve spare. We clip this, divide it and remove. And now I'll show you once the prostate is out, the vest, the areas that we're actually preparing are here. Let me show this to you. So here's our end results. As you can see, you don't see the nerve bundles anymore. They're buried behind the lateral prostatic fascia here. And in a second, I'll grab the lateral prostatic fascia. There it is. You can see the levators are also behind. So you don't see the levators. But I think this is a nice way to do a really nice nerve sparing where the nerve bundles aren't even seen. But obviously... Not every patient uh, gets a full nerve spare or needs a full nerve spare these days. And the tumor has changed. The oncology has changed. And so we do have to balance the oncology with the potency. Here you can see basically what's happening in my practice. High-risk patients have increased. And we showed that in our task force paper a few years ago, where we showed that before and after the task force decision, there was a key inflection point in high-risk disease. And we found that basically high-risk tumors were increasing and nurse sparing, full nurse sparing was decreasing in order to keep the margin rates low. As we look from the beginning in 2008 till now, there's a big change from 26% up to 63% in patients with high-risk disease. And so Instead of just focusing on how to do a full nerve spare, we've started to look at how to do a partial nerve sparing. And we work with Bernardo's team out in Milan, and we actually came up with a nice nomogram, which you can use, looking at site-specific and the amount of extra capsule extension. And this, this thing is available online, and you can actually plug in the preoperative data, and actually it will tell you which site is at risk for extra capsule extension and the amount. How do you know the landmarks? You know, we've looked at some vascular structures to tell us where we are on the nerve bundle. And these things are important. These small vascular structures can actually help us guide whether we're doing a full or a partial nerve sparing. And these three vessels are available in most patients. There's your posterior medial artery. You can see it here. There's your anterior medial artery. So these are just examples of things that we can see. Very, very important, as you can see here, doing a partial nerve sparing. And it's important. When you do a partial, you can take those vessels as a landmark, and it allows you to show. So as I finish up, I can show you some new data that's just coming out now. Ten years after the task force decision in 2012 against PSA screening, we looked at two groups of over 11,000 patients, 4,700 before, 66 after, when we looked at their functional oncologic outcomes. And as you can see, it's quite concerning, increase in volume of tumor, increase in high-risk disease, increase in most everything except the functional outcomes are getting worse because we're doing more partial nerve sparing because of the oncology of these tumors. Once again, you can see here a rise in the nerve sparing early on there in red, we had to adjust our, sorry, a rise in positive margins early on. We had to adjust our nerve sparing in order to level it off by doing more partials. Potency continence outcomes obviously get worse as you do more partial nerve sparing. So in conclusion, we're definitely seeing more aggressive tumors, larger volume, lower rates of nerve sparing, and this is affecting our outcomes for sure. As you know, recently, uh, there was a JAMA article showing increased metastatic prostate cancer also in these tumors after the uh, task force guidelines. And this is probably the most important message to go to urologists is, you know, things are changing, but making it somewhat more difficult for us. Uh, recently, last week in the Wall Street Journal, they showed in the U.S., all cancers were down by one-third since 1991 
except prostate cancer was up 4.5% annually, increasing high-risk disease since 2012. So 10 years of 4.5% increase. So we are definitely seeing more high risk, more oligomestag disease. We're doing more salvages. And so the low risk patients are few and far between. So it's more about partial nerve sparing, not just full nerve sparing anymore. Um, we've had to modify our techniques and obviously that does affect outcomes. But we can't say if you have a good patient with reasonable disease, good function, and you do a full nerve sparing, we can do those. And those guys do really well. But the oncology of the tumor definitely dictates uh, what we're doing. And so we definitely have to educate our colleagues. We should definitely use some of the advanced imaging that we have available. And I think that's our future. Intraoperative imaging, artificial intelligence, these things will actually help us fight what we're seeing because I think the increase in high risk is going to continue to increase for quite a few years. So this is not the end of the story. So lessons learned, yeah, we're still learning uh, after 16,000 plus cases, and we're doing the best to modify our technique in order to best help our patients. So definitely an evolution. This is a picture of some of our fellows in the past who have joined us, including Dr. Rocco. As you can see, he was here. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to give this talk. Well, thank you very much, uh, Veep. This was a, a, an extraordinary lecture as always. Um, as uh, I mentioned before, in the meanwhile, I see that uh, Professor Rocco is here. Um, so uh, I don't know, Bernardo, do you want to say a few words um, before we start the question and answer? Thank you very much. I'm sorry for my delay before. Uh, thank you very much to you and uh, to you as a chief of EARS. I really enjoyed Dr. Patel's talk and uh, wonderful presentation of cases, the evolving technique that I have seen during my fellowship nearly 15 years ago is uh, always uh, more precise and the new technology helps a lot to become uh, even more efficient. But uh, as uh, he reported after 16,000 cases, endless learning curve, because I think that this is a very difficult operation that has a lot of nuances, a lot of new things to control and one case is different to the other. So uh, the challenge, of course, is to masterize the technique and the new technology, and I think this is uh, our topic today. So congratulations to Dr. Patel and, uh, and his evolving technique that is probably the most used in the world. Thank you, Bernardo. So, so Veep, um, if you don't mind, there are a couple of questions uh, that uh, I think it's they are important. Uh, um, and, um, the first one is, uh, um, let me just go here. There are a few ones. So let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Philip Reich. Um, and he's, he has three questions for you. Maybe we can summarize some of those. The first one is, do you measure membranous urethral length prior to surgery to decide what is uh, to be done, get early continence? No, we don't. Uh, we just try and maximally preserve it. Um, obviously, if there's a big apical tumor, we have to adjust. So in most patients, you don't have tumor extension into the urethra. So with the kind of exposure I like to get now, you see our modified apical dissection. I see the apex really well, and I can maximize urethral length. So we try and always save as much as we can. And uh, again, uh, uh, does age play a role in, a, in early continence in your experience? Not necessarily. Um, I think it's actually the nerve sparing is important, um, how they are preoperatively. You know, the guys with the big prostate sometimes take longer. The guys who always take longer, the large tumors, the guys you do a wide resection, I tell them preoperative, they're going to leak more and for longer because we're hurting the neurovascular. But age, I think, you know, we have guys old and young, they can all be dry early or take their time. No, I don't think it makes a difference. Good. Um, I thought it would make a difference, to be honest with you. I found that uh, in, in the elderly, elderly population, for instance, no matter what I do, even if we do nerve sparing, uh, we are doing, uh, I don't know in your experience, uh, what is your cutoff age for prostatectomy? Um, in my experience, uh, I see that uh, we see more and more people with a large life expectancy. 
uh, longer than 10 years. And so we're operating in gentlemen, there are 75, sometimes even 76 or 77 sometimes. So, um, and in that population, uh, we found that uh, the early continence is um, uh, not the same as if you were operating uh, in 50 years old. Uh, any comment on this? Yeah. yeah, it's changed. You know, when we did open surgery, the cutoff was 70. And then when we did robotics, it was 75. It's higher. You know, we've gotten guys well into their 80s. And, you know, we're in Florida. We're in Florida. Everybody's older and they're healthy. And so a 75-year-old in Florida has a good chance of going 20 years and because they look as good as 50-year-olds. So we don't select based on age. Uh, physiologic health is important, but they do just as well continence-wise. I think, you know, if they have a good pelvic floor, they should do well. But uh, the nerve sparing is, is more of an impact than I thought it would be. If you do a good nerve sparing and you don't traumatize the tissue, they actually, their continence is just as good. Bernardo, any any comment on this? Sir? Microphone, microphone. Your microphone is off, Bernardo. Uh, sorry, it's I, because of the robots. They're all continent. Of course, <laughs> they are. But majority of the patients, honestly, are. But the time to continence recovery, actually, also in my experience, and uh, same thing for potency recovery, is uh, related to to age. And uh, uh, as Alberto said, uh, also as we are moving a little bit um, ahead in terms of age, the um, uh, oldest patient was 83 because he was uh, very fit and uh, really wanted to do the, the operation for a high risk disease. Uh, anyway, he has good continence, but uh, generally speaking, I agree that probably the tone of the muscular tissue is not the same, so it might be an issue. I just add to, uh, I think that we have another issue that can be reported in the question regarding the blood and neck sparing approach that I know uh, you are not that much convinced that can can help from uh, Dr. Van der Broek. What do you think? Does it make any difference to preserve the blood and neck? No, no, not at all. Um, I think as long as you reconstruct it, I try to make my bladder neck, you know, just a little bit bigger than the urethra. It allows me to do a good anastomosis, get the catheter out early. But when you try to preserve the bladder neck, you know, we're seeing these tumors at the base of the prostate, the margin rates are going to go higher. So it's not worth that. But when you can just reconstruct it and have good continence outcomes, it doesn't make a difference, no. If I may comment on this, uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right, Vipa. Uh, bladder neck reconstruction, um, I'm sorry, bladder neck preservation does not help uh, continence. Uh, that we know from a long time, I think. Uh, but the issue here for me is that whenever I can, I like to spare the bladder neck, not for the continence, but I think that when you have a big bladder neck and you have to do the lateral stitches or the anterior racket, uh, you have a high <laughs> of uh, having uh, a leakage of urine or a complication related to that. So that's why when it is possible for me, I like to have a, a, a very narrow bladder neck. My personal... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think the end result is the bladder necks, that's the normal size and that's the key. You can save it or not save it, but as long as you end up with a pretty good size bladder neck that's just a little bit bigger than the urethra, and you get a good anastomosis, I think then yeah. those guys do well. Final question to you is uh, um, uh, at least, uh, well, there, there are a couple of questions, transfers to sextraperitoneal. I think I can answer that. I don't think there's any, any changes in this uh, technique. It's just a matter of uh, what you like. And if you have to do an, ex an extended lymphadenectomy, maybe the extraperitoneal is not the right way to go. But uh, this is important question. What is your opinion about the no clip technique uh, versus uh, clipping uh, versus uh, pinpoint coagulation? Do you think that the pinpoint monopolar coagulation is affecting the, the bundles? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to use clips, you have to put them correctly. You know, like I showed in my retrograde, if, if you put the clips in the right place away from the nerves, I think that's the purest technique because you're not using energy and you're not causing too much traction. Any energy, it's been shown, no matter how much you use, if you use it close to the nerve bundle, it, you're going to get transmission. There are parts of the operation you can use energy and you're far enough away. But once you get to the nerve sparing, I think you have to turn your energy off if you want to do a full nerve sparing and get early recovery. The reason patients have delayed 
recovery of potency, even with a full nerve spare, is if you use too much traction or if you use energy. Otherwise, if you did a full nerve spare, everyone should be continent potent immediately, right? And they're not. So it depends upon how much traction you use. But if you use cautery, you're going to have some damage for sure. But if you use clips poorly, you're going to cause damage as well. So you have to do it right. Bernardo, you are the leader of this uh, the, of this webinar. Do you think that uh, we can take five minutes more? I know you were extra time, but I think having VIP with us uh, with this extra extraordinary experience together with Jihad Kauk uh, deserve a little bit more time. So we we can we can uh, get the advantage of having them here and ask more questions. So what do you say? I agree 100%. So let's move on to the other questions regarding, as an example, what is the lymph node involvement in the tissue anterior to the prostate? Does it influence the outcome? This is a nice question on uh, Retsu's uh, lymph node tissue. I know your answer, but please go ahead. Yeah, um, you're talking about the, the fat on top of the prostate taking that tissue out? Mm -hmm. You know, there are some uh, fat tissue over the retsus, uh, and uh, sometimes you can get some lymph nodes there. They were described by Walter Artibani long ago. I think there is a minority of lymph nodes in that area, and uh, I don't really think that this yeah. makes a big difference. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, my, my feelings on that are clear. I think there's retsus sparing just doesn't make sense if you want to do a, a nice clean operation. I think it's harder to see. It's more difficult. I think uh, the anterior approach is more direct. It's quicker, you know, hour, hour and a half to get the prostate out and you see everything. So the whole surgery is about exposure. The more you can see, the better you can see, the more control you have. And therefore, you can actually think more about the cancer and not about the technique of the operation. That's the key. And uh, so I will always do the technique where I can see the best. And if I can see the best, then I think I have control and then the oncology can dictate what I need to do, not my surgical technique. So that's my philosophy. I have a very, a very challenging question now from Dr. Donmetz. Is neurovascular nerve sparing surgery be performed in locally advanced prostate cancer? Do we not increase the risk of positive surgical margins? So how we deal with the local advanced disease? Can we save the bundles or how do you perform your strategy before surgery? How do you plan it? Yeah, you're going to see patients with some extension on MRI and so forth. And sometimes you have to do a wide resection, and most of the times you can do a partial. Um, I talked a little bit in my lecture about the nomogram we use to predict the amount of extension. Um, I use all the things. You know, I use the MRI. I use the nomogram. We palpate it. And then you make a calculated judgment. Do we increase the chance of a positive margin if we're saving? Yes, I think you do. But you can minimize the increase versus normal if you take in all the data points. This is where interoperative imaging will make a difference. If we can do a in real time, know exactly where the tumor is during surgery and how close it is, then you can potentially spare everyone that deserves a full nerve spare. Right now, we're just guessing. We're guessing this tumor is one millimeter here or one millimeter there. And our experience, hopefully, is helping us guess. But until we can see where the tumor is and how close it is to the to where you're working, it's going to be a guess, and we're going to have positive margins. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. I think that also for uh, the organization, we have to move on and uh, really you. enjoy your talk. And uh, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. I'll keep okay. watching. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you for Bye. being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Super. So, Albert, we move on with the Jihad Kauk that uh, I would like personally thank a lot for being with us with uh, his uh, uh, wonderful experience on single port da Vinci robotic prostatectomy. Thank you very much also for waiting, uh, Jihad. We are really, really excited to see your talk. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Rocco, and uh, uh, for this uh, invitation. I mean, I'm very uh, much impressed talking to the EuroWeb team about this program uh, and the high educational platform uh, that have been built here. Um, uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to follow uh, 
uh, Dr. Patel with his wonderful presentation uh, you just heard. Uh, my topic today is going to be about the single port. So I'm going to be uh, limiting my discussion to the single port approach, knowing that the system itself is not yet available uh, in Europe, uh, but it's good to see uh, what's being uh, done with it uh, ahead of being uh, you know, present in the market in, in Europe. I'll share my screen here. Um, let me see how I can do that. Um, Share. Do you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure that I get to full screen here. And all right. Okay. So uh, uh, these are my disclosures, and. Um, these disclosures have no impact on my presentation uh, today. The topic of uh, laparoscopy is not new. Uh, single port have been done uh, since uh, about uh, 2007. At that time, there was no uh, purpose-built robot for it. So you can see that we tried to use uh, laparoscopic straight instruments through one incision, and that created a lot of clashing. We noticed that that is a very difficult task to teach and replicate. So then we tried the multiport robot, as you can see in this third picture here, and trying to crowd all the instruments in one incision. Also, that was very difficult due to clashing and the bulky instruments that the multiport robot have. So now we have a purpose built robot that comes all in one cannula. That cannula is about two and a half centimeter in diameter. From it comes a camera and three instruments. The camera is steerable, so it has joints. You can look around corner. And of course, it comes with a learning curve because of that. And also you have instruments. These are double-wristed instruments. So instead of just having a wrist, you have a wrist and an elbow for each of the instruments. We did not want to just focus on one incision versus multiple incision. Rather, we wanted to use the single port robot that's a low profile robot to go into narrow areas that otherwise the bulky robot is difficult to go. That's why we started focusing on extra peritoneal approaches, transvesical approaches, and uh, tunneled uh, approaches rather than just replicate what we do with the multiport. Because the multiport have been perfected so well, especially in urology, and you saw the lecture before me, how far did we go over the last 20 years with the multiport? So it will not be really useful to replicate that with a single port. Rather, we want to get the value from the purpose built low profile robot to go to areas that otherwise are difficult to do with the multiport. The single port robot, you know, uh, that's been introduced is just the first version of it. The camera is great, the vision is excellent, but still, you know, the uh, amount of choices of instruments that you have are still limited. You can compare that to the multiport robot back in 2005 and six and seven, you can see that the XI today is much better than the S robot and so on. And we expect to keep improving with the SP example is that the SP does not have a stapler, robotic stapler, but that is coming soon as I understand. Let's dive into the prostate application because the SP in urology can be done for partial nephrectomies, radical nephrectomy, even kidney transplant, extraperitoneal, have all been done and reported in an effective way. The nice thing about the prostate is that over the years, with the introduction of the robot, we did two things. One is that we moved a lot of the surgeries that used to be extraperitoneal to strictly transperitoneal. And that's a limitation. To do transperitoneal, you need to put the patient in the trendylember position, head down for the gravity to pull the bowel out of the way. There is some 
manipulation of the bowel, there are scar tissue, especially in hostile abdomen, and so on. So now with the single port, we created a custom make approach to our patient. That means there is no one approach that fits all. We, according to the presentation of the patient, we will decide if we want to go transperitoneal, extraperitoneal, resius sparing, transvesical, transperineal robotic. So now with more options, the surgeon can tailor the approach hoping for improvement in the overall outcomes of the surgery. Specific patients that have a big problem are examples here. These patients have multiple surgeries. Many of them have their rectum removed, ulcerative colitis, lot of sensitive bowel, and really prohibitive to go through these pel pelvises uh, through the transperitoneal approach without increasing the risk of bowel injury. These patients benefit the most from our transvesical approach, for example. We make an incision straight into the bladder and do the surgery from inside out, as you will see in a moment. So after 20 years of practice, I've really shifted my uh, practice in robotic prostatectomy in specific to a custom-make approach, where, as I said, depends on the presentation of the patient. I will go transvesical, in most of the patients, especially those that have scars in their belly from previous surgeries, but the prostate is still under about 100 gram uh, in size. Because the larger the prostate, the more space it will take, makes it difficult to go transvesical. For those patients who have more advanced disease and I want to do more aggressive uh, lymph node dissection, I will go extraperitoneal still single port, stay extraperitoneal, and by that I can have an excellent access to the lymph node dissection on both sides because your entry side is one, so you can really rotate along your axis and have good view of uh, any quadrant you want to look with the robot. And for the transperineal approach, I reserve it nowadays for cases that, in addition to a frozen pelvis, they've had a shattered bladder where you know, motor vehicle accident or previous a lot surgeries in the bladder that I can't access the bladder safely, then for these patients, I will go transperineal to do the surgery. Transperineal, I keep it as the last option because it's the most complex between all three and the most demanding technically to do. Uh, and I will touch base on the um, uh, learning curve a little bit of this. So let's focus on the transvesical approach. How do we do it? First, the patient is flat. No need for trendy limber because the gas bubble, you know, is gonna be only in the bladder. We make an incision. The incision is just above the pubic bone in the midline, about three centimeter. We fill the bladder. And after filling the bladder, you will be able to put a, uh, a guide needle, as you can see in there, and, uh, and make a cystotomy put your traction sutures, and after that, I'll be able to dock the robot straight into the bladder itself, as in this movie uh, here and here. These are bubble ports, uh, specific ports that have a ring that goes into the bladder and a ring that stays at the skin level, and you can dock the robot. Alternatively, you can make your own port by a gel port platform or others, uh, you know, ways that you can connect the robot to. The nice thing is that we use what we call a hovering or floating technique of the robot. So you can see that that bright spot is the tip of the scope. The robot is not in the patient. The robot is actually hovering on top of the patient inside the bubble. And that allows me to do surgery even in shallow areas, no matter how shallow the field is, because I don't need a depth. I can move the robot out of the patient that need a depth to spread my instruments outside the cannula. This is how the port looks like. There are many ways to configure. Another important aspect is the suction. We use a flexible suction, so it's steerable. It gives control to the surgeon on the console to do everything. And when I say that, the job description of the bedside surgeon was minimized. And by minimizing it, you really you're not dependent on your assistant anymore. 
I have medical students, I have residents, junior people who help me without noticing. And that's in contradistinction to my multi-port approach where you are really independent, uh, dependent on your uh, bedside uh, assistant. Here is just to show you how the port goes into the bladder with the uh, transvesical approach. And um, this is a cystoscopic view just to demonstrate it. This is the procedure, the transvesical single port. This is the first view you will see. From the very immediate minute, you will be inside the bladder. You identify the trigon. You can see the urethral orifices. And you start with a smiley face incision to undermine the trigon. If you're doing a simple prostatectomy, you go through the capsule. If you're doing a radical prostatectomy, you stay outside the capsule, get the vesi on both sides, seminal vesicle, plain posterior to the rect posterior to the prostate, anterior to the rectum, as far as you can see. You can see that the clipping is done by the surgeon. So you use five millimeter clip applier. You can clip for yourself. You can suction for yourself. After completing the posterior dissection, I do the anterior dissection. And by that, I will get back to the vascular pedicle that now have been dissected above and below, making it very easy to identify vascular pedicle and the nerves crossing under it to start peeling the nerves towards the apex. And here, the dorsal vein is being sutured. We've modified our technique recently where we do not open the endopelvic fascia, we do not cut, we do not suture the dorsal vein, and basically the nerves are kept embedded within the lateral aspect of the field as uh, shown previously. This is the apex, excellent view of the apex and the urethra. The bladder is being now, uh, the prostate is being uh, delivered into the bladder. Can we do lymph node dissection? Absolutely but limited lymph node dissection through the transvesical approach through the gap where the prostate was. So I use that for low-risk prostate cancer where the brigand score is more than seven indicated to do lymph node. Here I'm using barbed suture to do the urethrovesical anastomosis. And uh, you can see that the suturing is a little bit different because the instruments don't really articulate like the XI robot it deflect like a snake move uh, because the joints are a little bit different on this robot. The force at the tip of the robot, the SP robot is less than what you have on the XI, but that may not be a bad thing in prostatectomy. Less force mean more gentle on the nerve, less retraction is not a bad thing when you get the right retraction and the right angle to retract. So that is the uh, uh, transvesical prostatectomy. Lymph node dissection. So for the lymph node dissection, as I said, if there is a brigandi score nomogram of more than seven, we do the lymph node dissection. I'm gonna show you just a little bit of the transvesical because I get this question a lot about the space is limited. How can you get to do lymph node? Well, remember these are double jointed instruments and the camera is steerable. So I can move everything to one side and through that gap, the bigger the prostate, the more the gap, the more I can actually do lymph nodes. And you can see the mainly obturator lymph node area. I can identify it, get the uh, packet of the obturator nerve, as you can see there, and deliver it same business as usual, basically. Can I go all the way up to the crossing of the ureter? Maybe, but that will be very cumbersome through this approach. For those patients who need such an extended lymph node, I will go extra peritoneal from the very beginning for these patients. So this is the lymphatic packet uh, on the left side, as you can see, uh, delivered all through the transvesical uh, approach. Uh, I'm going to keep moving for the sake of time. So let's talk about the learning curve. How much time do I need for the transvesical? Remember that I told you that the transperineal approach is really difficult to teach. Um, you know, from experience doing it uh, for the last four years, it's really not easy to transmit the uh, expertise easily, uh, uh, you know, after 50 cases. So here for the transvesical approach, we noticed that uh, examining our outcomes, that about 20 cases 
is where the sweet spot would be for robotic surgeons who know how to do robotic surgery, but want to go transvesical uh, to do single port transvesical uh, prostatectomy. What we found really uh, astonishing and beyond our expectation was the urinary continence. This was the approach that compared to all other approaches that impacted the outcomes significantly. What I mean by that, time to continence is very short using transvesical. Probably um, because we did not mobilize the bladder, we did a very gentle dissection at the apex, and that duplicates what you see in the Rizia sparing. I would argue even I see it more without the impact of increased positive margins. So half of our patient, almost 50% of our patients, when we get the catheter out three days after surgery, not one week, the patients are continent and they do not require any pad. And I'm very thrilled to offer these to my patients, especially those coming from far away. They stay, you know, in Cleveland to get the catheter a week later. How about stay only three days to get the catheter later and then be continent half of the time? I mean, the other patients will catch up. So if you examine these patients three and six months later, you know, the results of continence is similar if we go uh, transvesical or other approaches. But this time to continence have been very specific to our transvesical approach. And one caveat I learned is that when I try to do the uh, lymph node dissection, by that mobilizing the bladder a little bit from the sides, this uh, immediate continence percentage get less. So not only the apical dissection is important for continence, time to continence, but also these bladder suspenders seem to be playing an important role. And this is also what we see when we go rizia sparing compared to other uh, transperitoneal approaches. So are we compromising on oncological outcomes when we go transvesical? And the answer is no. 16% positive margins for our patient is a very reasonable number. Uh, of which 77% have limited uh, focal positive only uh, in minor areas. Remember that 70% of our patients go for bilateral nerve sparing. The most common area for positive margin is not the bladder neck, since this is transvesical. It's actually the apex, more so on the left apex. So I'm going to, uh, what about uh, BCR, biochemical recurrence? Actually, our biochemical recurrence mir mirror what we have in the multiport, and it's minimal, uh, even with the 16% positive margin. I'll take uh, my last uh, couple minutes here to tell you what's next. What's next, really, now that we have done so well in continence of these patients, and half of them don't wear any pads, and three days only for the Foley catheter, we are focusing on the uh, nerve sparing. And for select patients who have lateralized disease and patients who come for HIFO for focal therapy, what we are doing for these patients, we are offering them also focal partial nephrectomy. So focal therapy in form of surgery. These patients under ultrasound guidance, 3D ultrasound guidance, fusion with an MRI, digitally tagged tumor, we can do a transvesical approach to do partial prostatectomy for these patients. And in our first uh, uh, 15 patients pilot study, we found that 100% of the patients at three weeks post-op were continent and potent. And this was really thrilling, thrilling for us uh, to see that uh, kind of an outcome, sure for very selected, uh, patients that we are at this point very carefully selecting. You can see how we can digitally tag the tumor in red, the urethra in yellow, and ultrasound gives me real-time imaging to where I'm cutting, and the lower image there shows you pre and post MRI showing the index lesion have disappeared. It's not there anymore. Last thing here is that since we regionalized surgery, how about regionalizing anesthesia? So because now we don't do pneumoperitoneum to do a prostatectomy, we are doing pneumovesicum. So the CO2 is only in the bladder. It does not push on the diaphragm. So we can keep the patient awake if the patient wished so. 
So significant amount of our patients now are actually under twilight sedation, like going for a colonoscopy and having epidural. This patient actually is talking to me, telling me, doc, are you putting the last sutures there? Here I'm showing him the prostate when I'm removing it, showing that everything went well. While the patient is being closed at this point, we didn't even close the patient yet. And that is uh, being actually uh, exciting for some patients. Obviously, there are some patients who want to be totally asleep and don't want to have that. My last slide here is that for single port, don't think about it as one incision multi or multiple incision. Think about the value about any innovation you, you introduce. And the value for single port prostatectomy as we see it is value to the patient. Patients now are discharged home within three hours after surgery in 92% of the time. Patients do not wear any pad after a prostatectomy in about 50% of the time. Patients don't get any narcotics post up because it's not that painful. And these patients now we're looking into how to improve on their potency in a much higher level than it used to be. For the surgeon, custom make approach to the surgery. You have many options to deal with any patient presentation. And for the health system, we moved our cases almost entirely to outpatient. So for the same hospital bed capacity, the patients that we do are outpatients. So the hospital bed can go for to serve another patient. So we do more surgeries uh, with the same number of beds, and that will offset the extra cost that it came up with this innovation and single port. And with that, I give credit to our fellows who without them, none of this uh, pushing the limit uh, would have happened. So uh, thank you again for the EuroWeb and for Dr. Rocco uh, for the opportunity and invitation to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Dr. Takouk. I think that uh, this new approach is really a game changer and it was great to see the uh, complete presentation from uh, how you develop the technique and how you use it today and what is can be the role in the daily practice. Alberto, what is your feeling on this new, new approach? Well, first of all, let me congratulate Jihad uh, for being always a pioneer in everything. Whenever I think of something new, he has done it. So, um, of course, uh, this is uh, a very interesting uh, way to approach the prostate. Uh, um, I'm, I'm still uh, not very much convinced uh, of uh, its feasibility in terms of... Uh, um, rendering this uh, uh, available to many centers because you do need the SP port to do this. Um, and therefore, I don't know how much the SP uh, will uh, uh, influence our practice in the future. I'm not sure about that. In Europe, we still don't have it, so we'll see what will happen. But but I think it's 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 more or less the same concept as Aldo Bocciardi was saying, uh, the red sea sparing, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, preservation of, of bundles, it makes a lot of sense uh, the way that he is doing it. Um, also for whole hip uh, is, uh, is a very nice, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for enucleation of the prostate is a very nice approach as he showed. I'm very tempted uh, uh, to, to see uh, the, the future of the partial prostatectomy. We heard that a uh, few times already. Um, it makes sense uh, whether it's going to be the future or not, we will see. Yeah, I, if I can make a comment, you know, uh, thank you, Professor Breda, um, for your for, for your uh, kind comments there. Uh, you know, I agree with you that you know uh, uh, outcomes will tell us if this is a procedure that uh, will have a place in the future or not, and that's why we have made a consortium. We call it Spark Single Port Advanced Research Consortium. We have uh, at this point in a database from. Uh, 14 centers around the country that have the SP, uh, we have 1,700 uh, patients of uh, prostatectomies with the SP. Not all transvesical, uh, you know, transvesical and other approaches. And uh, we will see. Uh, I'm with you. I'm a data-driven person. But from what I'm seeing, I'm really very optimistic because this transvesical approach, one, is not prohibitive to teach. You know, it's not that difficult to teach. Second is that the uh, continence uh, mirrored, uh, at least mirrored what uh, we saw on the Rizzi's sparing with uh, Professor Bocciardi uh, technique without the 
peak and positive margin. So because we can see a little bit more when you are very close to the prostate. And uh, for the continence, this continence issue of not having any pads is very exciting. So compared to the rhizia sparing, we have similar short term to continence, but we avoid the abdomen. So by avoiding the abdomen, the scar tissue, previous surgery, the T-berg that we don't really, we underestimate the side effects of T-berg, trendelenburg, head down, the congestion that happened, this, the uh, respiratory ventilation problem during the surgery, especially that our patients are really heavy in the area that I practice in. So thank you very much indeed. We have uh, from the audience a couple of questions for you. Why is the, uh, I guess, SP not RP robot not yet available in Europe? Thanks for presentation. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, I can't speak for the company itself, but I think every country have their own set of regulations that any, uh, any company have to abide by. So I heard that uh, this is being in process. Uh, when would it be available in Europe? I don't know, but I'm sure uh, any technology that proves value will disseminate across the world. So I'm sure it's going to be at one point, but that's a personal opinion. Do you think intravesical total prostatectomy can be done by intravesical classic laparoscopy? I've done it before. I've done it laparoscopically. It's extremely difficult to suture uh, with that, not because of lack of experience, it's because of the angle. Even if you use the handheld motorized uh, laparoscopic uh, needle holders, it's very difficult. We can some. Uh, we have also used the multi-port robot before the single port going through the bladder. There's a lot of clashing. At the end of the day, you will end with a bigger incision in the bladder that may not be appealing, and the angle is not right to do any lymph node, and the suturing is difficult. So the SP seem to be really a great fit for the transvesical approach, surely for the uh, simple prostatectomy inoculation, perfect approach. Because the inoculation, I'm diverting on the topic here, you know, we've always talked about cutting the adenoma, but we missed talking about the reconstructive part of the procedure, and that's the 360 degree suturing of the mucosa to close all the raw surface when you remove the adenoma in a simple prostate. And that's what now we can do routinely. Jihad, let me let me ask you a question, um, because the point here for me with the SP, at least when it will, if it will, but I guess it will arrive in Europe, uh, is how to convince the other administration to buy an SP system. Um, because of course now we're talking about transvesical prostatectomy. You are the master of that. Let's see what what it will be the future of this. But if I had to um, do a a nephrectomy or a cystectomy or a larger surgery, then of course, probably the single port is my impression is not so good, or at least not yet. So maybe we could involve other specialties, uh, um, like the otorhinolaryngoiatry, the, like the thoracic surgery. So what do you think about it? Yeah, uh, great point. I mean, I'll tell you some, uh, some present uh, examples. So in South Korea, they have the single port robot. But, and they've done thousands more cases than of uh, what we've done in America. But that's not urology. Urology is only like maybe 5%. More than 90% actually is ENT and colorectal and others. And they're just actually activating more their urology program now, two years later, three years later. So yes, one is the multidisciplinary approach. And there's a lot that can be done that will benefit from limited areas, narrow areas. Because if you can have a large area and you're doing it effectively, do the multiport. No problem. The single port is not about replacing a multiport at all. Is that can you regionalize your surgery and maybe anesthesia? Do single port. If you cannot, don't continue with the multiport. So, yes, multidisciplinary approach. Then remember that it's even more effective to get outpatient. This outpatient is cost saving big time especially in hospitals that are at full capacity, always full. So by not using a hospital bed, that bed goes for another patient. They do a gallbladder, a colectomy or a laparotomy, whatever they need. So now we are 
For example, I do three, four hundred prostatectomies a year. These are now three, four hundred hospital beds per year available for my hospital to use for another patient. Mm -hmm. So that's where the cost saving come. Uh, of course, it's a little bit more expensive if you will count only the instruments you open in the operating room. But the surgical episode is not only limited to what happened in the operating room. So if you had to convince me, uh, when I saw you and many of you of us doing laparoscopy, you know, we are a little bit older now, we can speak like uh, the old guys, but uh, uh, we started with laparoscopy, me and you, and uh, I saw the transition from lap laparoscopies to single port surgery. And in the beginning, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of papers coming out, but then it, it declined and it was clearly uh, shown that single port, uh, laparoscopic single port uh, was not that easy. Do we see the same thing here with multiple port robotic surgery and single port surgery? Or do you think that now really we are ready for single port surgery? So, uh, you know, uh, excellent point there. I tell you that it's not only about uh, the instruments. Now we have a purpose-built robot, so we have a much more effective instrument. But I will go much more beyond that. It's not about the instrument at all. It was about the mindset. We got the wrong mindset in 2007. We focused on one cut versus multiple, replicating every single step we do otherwise with the multi-cut laparoscopy. What we're doing today is totally different mindset. If I was to use a transperitoneal prostatectomy with single port, why? What am I, I'm touching the bowel, I'm putting the patient in T-Berg, I mean, all what I'm doing is one incision versus multiple. I don't expect any difference. I would expect worse, actually, because I'm used to my multiport. But if I was to go in limited areas, like the transvesical you saw today, to get quicker time to continence and discharge earlier and no pain and three days polycatheter, okay, these benefits, then I, yeah, because I can go in with a narrow area, low profile robot that I can't otherwise do with the multiport. So the mindset of what you select to apply the single port is going to be the key to success this time compared to 2007. Thank you. Super. I have a very, very last quick question for you. And then I think that we have to move on. How many cases is needed for a naive junior who have no experience with the transpiratorial approach to achieve the learning curve for the transversal, uh, transversal approach? So, so I would say, you know, for somebody who have a robotic slash laparoscopic background, about 20 cases will be good for you to get used to using the robot, select your cases, easy cases, maybe start with a transvesical, simple prostatectomy, and then the radical prostate. But for somebody who is not uh, used to robotics and not used to laparoscopy, the big difference is that open surgeons look at the field. Laparoscopists and robotic surgeons look at the screen and operate with their hands. So that's a different learning curve. So if you bypass that first learning curve, I think 20 cases will be fine. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Kauk. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we have uh, attended a great talk and uh, something absolutely exciting. And uh, we have to move on because uh, we are a little bit uh, out of time. So thanks again and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the invitation. Take care. Thank you. So now is uh, time to uh, Dr. Albreda's talk on uh, another potential game changer. Is it a game changer, Alberto? Let's understand what is your point on this uh, new technology, Hugo Ross robotic prostatectomy, please. There I go, just give me. A second, I will put it big. All right. So thank you, Bernardo. And uh, and the first question to me, and I'll try to be as short as possible. We are a little bit late. But the first question to me nowadays is, uh, why should I invest money as a hospital uh, to buy a new system, uh, provided that the intuitive, uh, the XI, the X, or the SP are in the market and are surely the best robot uh, out there? And the reason may come from the images you will see. 
And also the reasons are multiple. Uh, first of all, uh, the cost. The cost uh, is less expensive and for your hospital administration is certainly more important. Uh, um, but also a costless uh, procedure doesn't exist. So uh, robotic surgery is uh, something that you should uh, look into uh, as a potential investment for your hospital, but also as outcomes for your patients. And in my opinion, uh, the Medtronic Ugorad system not only is a highly competitive robotic system to intuitive, but also the results from our early experience are quite similar and the learning curve is definitely not a problem. Let me tell you something related to the robot itself. For those of you who don't know the system, it comes with an open console. In the very beginning, I thought this was the disadvantage uh, since you are looking in a screen like a laparoscopic screen with glasses on, so a 3D 4K system. Um, um, and in the beginning, I thought it was not ideal, but in the end, it turns out uh, that when you're sitting in your OR with an open console, you now have a full control of the OR. You're not isolated, uh, but you can talk to your assistant, you can talk to the nurse, uh, you can talk to the anesthesiologist, uh, and therefore, I think you have uh, a much better feeling that you're part of the OR. Number two, the, the, the joystick that you're seeing uh, are absolutely astonishing in my vision. The pedals uh, are exactly the same as you would have in the Da Vinci system. And therefore, again, learning curve of these, uh, particularly for those of you who are coming from the laparoscopic world, uh, are not that difficult. Here you see me operating, uh, and you see that uh, the dexterity of the instruments uh, are extremely good. You can tell that uh, uh, other than the 3D console vision and the glasses, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, ergonomy of the system is quite similar to what you would expect uh, to a latest generation robotic system. Now, the instruments that are available right now for robotic surgery are uh, quite limited. This is uh, something that will evolve in the future, but at least uh, you can count on the Mary bi uh, Maryland bipolar forceps, uh, the fenestrated bipolar, the Cadier forceps, uh, nar large needle driver together with uh, the scissors. And one of the, the, the good uh, uh, things of these ro robots is uh, definitely, in my opinion, the scissors, uh, which are, in my opinion, very nice. Uh, and finally, we have scissors that truly cut. Uh, we come up with uh, this paper a few months ago, uh, together with a group from uh, Alex Motri. We studied the way you need to position uh, uh, your trockers and your and your um, uh, ports. And here you see that, uh, unlike the Da Vinci system, where you have a, 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 a single arm uh, with four arms, uh, here you have uh, four single units that are independent to each other and therefore there are certain grades that you have to use in order in order to uh, position the trokers not to have conflict but as soon as you learn this and this is uh, we already done the job for you so you just need to read the paper and apply the grades uh, and the position of 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 the arms uh, that's a piece of cake and here you see a docking of the robot in a real life case a radical prostatectomy and here you see the different different cards already positioned, uh, position, positioned with the assistants uh, at the table. So you see quite similar concepts uh, as you would expect uh, from the Da Vinci system. Uh, you have it here from the Metronic Hugo Raz. Now I have to say that one disadvantage uh, of this stroker position uh, is that the arms are quite tall, quite, quite high, and therefore the assistant is a little bit more uncomfortable at the table as opposed uh, to the Da Vinci system. Here is the prostatectomy. This is uh, uh, the way one of the, the, the ways I approach the prostate. In this case, we started uh, from the seminal vesicles, so like the old Monsori technique. But I would like to show you immediately the quality of the image. Um, for those of you that uh, had the uh, opportunity to try this system, uh, you would agree with me that the fact that this comes with the HD 4K 3D from car stores uh, provides a tremendous uh, quality of the vision. Um, in my opinion, uh, there is uh, this is one of the greatest advantages of uh, this system over the intuitive system. Again, the quality of the image. Other than that, you see that uh, uh, had I not 
told you that uh, I'm doing a robotic uh, uh, prostatectomy with the Medtronic system, I think that you could probably uh, see that the move movements are quite similar and the instruments move quite uh, uh, nicely as uh, with the Da Vinci system. You see here the positioning of the stitches uh, at the, um, uh, the center of plexus. Uh, you see as uh, Vip was showing uh, the Dental nerve, uh, I'm sorry, the pudental artery on the left, uh, um, which is beating quite fast. Uh, um, and you see that uh, again, uh, all the movements are exactly reproducible as uh, you would expect uh, from the Da Vinci system. Why am I saying this? Why am I comparing this uh, to the Da Vinci? Because in the end, uh, we are all used to use the Da Vinci system. And so for a robotic platform to be successful, in my opinion, uh, uh, it has to be as easy as possible in terms of learning curve. And for those who are robotic surgeons, the learning curve of this system is quite immediate. I would say that within five to 10 cases, you're used, uh, used to <clears throat> use this system, both for prostates and, and bladders, as well as for the kidneys. Although for the kidneys, is a little bit more technically challenging to place uh, the trokers. But in the end, it's just a matter of um, uh, working the space out. And here you see that I'm trying to find uh, the nice lateral aspect uh, as shown previously um, uh, by, by uh, Jihad and, uh, and B. Patel. Uh, and again, you see that uh, the quality of the vision, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, it's at least non inferior to what you would expect uh, from the Da Vinci system. Uh, again, uh, um, you know, this is uh, the other contralateral nerve sparing. I like to do the lateral approach and then do a little bit of retrograde uh, uh, um, uh, nerve sparing as, as I learned from Vip and Bernardo um, and, uh, and uh, the nerve sparing is performed. Uh, the apical dissection, again, uh, is uh, um, done uh, quite similarly to what you would expect uh, from uh, uh, all the robotic uh, uh, prostatectomy you have seen so far. Uh, a little comment I try here uh, to preserve the length of the urethra, as you see. For me, uh, this is the most important uh, part of the continence, uh, uh, even more important uh, than the nerve sparing. Uh, for me, the urethra length uh, is what provides uh, uh, the early continent, uh, the truly early continent, uh, um, uh, in my opinion. Again, uh, you see here that uh, uh, the nerve sparing is performed, the prostate is embedded, and here you see the Rocco stitch, the posterior reconstruction. I have to say that in the beginning, uh, we were not performing the Rocco stitch. We started to perform this stitch uh, um, quite similarly to how V. Patel and Bernardo are doing. Um, and I have to say that uh, we've seen uh, a, a very nice increase in the early continence. Uh, but more than that, uh, it renders uh, our anastomosis uh, quite easy. Um, and therefore, it approaches the bladder with a no tension uh, anastomosis between the bladder neck and the urethra. Um, here you see that uh, we are performing uh, all the anastomosis, and uh, in in my opinion, again, I don't find uh, uh, any difference uh, between uh, this uh, uh, robot and the Da Vinci system in terms of dexterity, ergonomy, and uh, easiness of use. Um, here I'm using a suture that is called Stratafix uh, from Eticon, and uh, uh, it's a very nice suture, although uh, uh, you need to make sure that you fix this suture, because even if it's a barbed suture, um, it slips a little bit, so you need to make sure that you tie quite a knots sometimes in a while, just to make sure that it doesn't slip. Uh, and here you see the final stitches uh, uh, to close and secure uh, the bladder neck. I also like to do a little bit of a, the anterior reconstruction. And in the end, uh, uh, this is the image. So far, you have to consider we acquired this system uh, um, last year in 2022. Uh, that was in uh, February. Together with Alex Mostri, we were the pioneer in Europe to perform this uh, uh, series. Um, but unfortunately, we had to stop because we had some problems with the instruments. So the Medtronic uh, allowed, uh, um, um, alerted us and we had to stop for over five months. And so we started over our experience in August. So, um, you know, we have a limited scissors is, um, series so far. We have done uh, 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 around 25 prostatectomies uh, and around 60 cases, including partial nephrectomies and radical nephrectomies. The results are quite good. I have to say that we have found, we found a little bit 
bit increase in the positive margin rate. I don't know, it is too early now to speculate whether this is due to the learning curve, to the new approach, to the fact that we see uh, so much better than with the uh, with the other system that we stay closer to the closer to the prostate. I still don't know, so no speculation on this. We will uh, update you later on uh, during the AUA uh, and next year over our uh, series. So in my opinion, uh, UGORAS system for robotic assisted uh, uh, prostatectomy, it's a big yes for uh, economic sustainability. The open console, I like it very much. The high quality endoscopic view provided by the car stores, a 3D 4K system uh, is absolutely superb. The sharpness of seizure, seizure absolutely a very good advantage. Uh, what I probably should advise you is uh, maybe to uh, wait and see a little a little bit. We are still at the first generation. New generation will come in the next future. The Cadier uh, uh, forces grasper are still a little bit with a low grip, so they are not uh, um, very strong. Uh, and uh, there's no ICG and no tile pro. So if you were doing partial nephrectomies, for instance, like I'm doing, uh, you need to get used to have the ultrasound on your side. So there's still no possibility to have the Tile Pro uh, incorporated in your system. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alberto, for this uh, great talk. Uh, it was very interesting for me to listen to your experience on this new device. Uh, after you, we joined the Medtronic family with uh, Hugo Ras. So uh, it's very important to understand uh, what are the advantages and the shortcomings uh, in your experience. And I agree 100% on what you said, uh, starting on uh, uh, the, the vision that is great and uh, the sharpness of the scissors and uh, the nice uh, tall instruments that can punish the assistant when it's not fine. So nice things that, that uh, we can share. If you like, we can move on with my talk and then share the discussion just to minimize our delay that is uh, anyway based on uh, i would say fantastic talks that uh, were done previously so um we um join uh, the webinar with the, our experience on a multi platform robotic program we uh, started in, uh, um, in uh, september 2020 we were not in this hospital but only the colorectal surgery started with the uh, Robotics it was uh, from scratch because there was no ex previous experience. We started again in uh, June 2021 when I moved from Modena. Uh, uh, urology started with robotic approach, then uh, GYN, thoracic ENT. And uh, from that, we had a single system at the beginning. Then uh, we started six months ago with, to have the second one, June 2022. And more recently, November 2022, two, two new robotic platforms that were settled up in our center. So at now we have four systems, and uh, three of them are CMR versus Medtronic Grass and uh, two uh, Da Vinci. I will be very quick on the description of the systems since uh, Berto did a great job with his videos. So you see here the open console for Medtronic, and you see that the open console of uh, versus CMR. Differences are that with the CMR, you can stand up and uh, work as a laparoscopist rather than being seat. And the second thing is that uh, everything is on your hands. So there are not foot pedals. This can be an advantage according to some or the disadvantage according to other point. You see the, the, um, the masters of the Medtronic Hugoras that I've had to show before. And here you see uh, the controls of the CMR uh, versus. Uh, it seems like a, a PlayStation controller uh, split in two. And all, all the controls are here. The, endos the endoscope can be moved with uh, these two buttons. Uh, uh, so it's a pretty strange thing to do to move uh, with the two different buttons, uh, the, um, uh, the vision. You see also the, the arms here. You see that both of systems have separate arms with uh, different joints that can uh, provide the appropriate movements. So uh, let's go quickly to our surgical experience with the different systems. Our experience is very initial, as I said, from uh, November, we perform uh, 10 UGORAL and one uh, robotic radical cystectomy with the UGO system and three versus uh, um, robotic prostatectomy. 
The first thing we would like to share with you is that we use the, the typical W configuration of Troker that we use uh, the very beginning of our experience with the standard systems, the standard DaVinci. We went across all the DaVinci systems and also with the Exile, we decided to stay on this W shape rather than going on a linear position. And this was good, particularly for the um, the use of the new, new platforms, since we can put the trucker more or less in the same position and uh, being happy also as for Ugoras as for Versus. This is good, particularly for the assistant. You have seen uh, the position that comes from uh, uh, the experience of Alex Motri. I'm, uh, of course, proud of the fact that uh, in the paper that was shown by Alberto Lucas Archi, that now is our assistant, was the first name. And here you see how we presented the uh, robotic prostatectomy on the Versus system. You see that the, the single uh, robotic arms with Medtronic comes from uh, the legs, basically, whereas the position of the Versus comes from the head. So two completely different a way to put the system that surrounds the patient. The position of the assistant is in both sides uh, in our technique on the right of the patient. So this is our experience of uh, the just three uh, comparable cases. You see that on the um, on the metrics, uh, we don't have any, any issue with the Da Vinci, whereas with Ugo and with the CMR, sometimes we can have uh, technical issues or collisions. And this is probably due to also to our learning curve that has not been completely uh, accomplished. Here we decided to show you the same passage of the three techniques, of the three systems, sorry. You see here on the left, the, um, the space between prostate and the NMES fascia on the uh, Da Vinci system. You see here the same thing on the Ugo Ras. And at the bottom, you see uh, the verses. So we try to uh, give you the feeling of the comparability of the to the three systems, uh, trying to select the same part of the case. So here you see the rightness pairing on the three system with the retrograde approach that Alberto mentioned before. The traction is provided by the forearm that comes from the left, and uh, there is a pro-grasp that is very well-known uh, instrument on the Da Vinci with the uh, Cadet forceps on the uh, Ugo Ras that I confirm also in my personal feeling has less strength than the, um, the um, pro-grasp of uh, Intuitive. You see here that it's also possible to do the same thing with the CMR that has probably a different uh, dynamic in terms of movements. Uh, it's um, the, the joints of the of the Maryland is in a slightly different position, so the angles that you can uh, catch with the with the CMR are uh, probably closer to the laparoscopic spheres compared to the other two systems. And uh, we know that our uh, friends, uh, general surgeon laparoscopists, really really enjoy this uh, this machine that has a. Uh, uh, these different dynamics. So you see that uh, we can provide a pretty acceptable nursing uh, on uh, all the three systems. The dissection uh, here. I'm watching the CMR with the dissection of the apex uh, is uh, very clean, and uh, also the um, possible or uh, the articulation of the arms can allow um, a good um, dissection of the urethra. The reconstruction is feasible with all the systems. The quality of the image, in my opinion, is very high with all the three systems, but I like very much the Hugo colors that uh, remind me a little bit the SI, but also the definition of the XI is absolutely outstanding. Probably the, there is a little bit more orange on the CMR that might be um, sometimes misleading, particularly if you have a uh, black clots that uh, reduce a little bit the visibility, but uh, we think that it will be uh, probably uh, better soon. But anyway, we have uh, a pretty good maneuverability. Takes probably a little longer to be done with, uh, with the CMR compared to the other two systems. The chance of transfer the um, ability from uh, Da Vinci to Metronic in our experience was basically one or two cases. And uh, also CMR that, of course, we have done only three cases, it takes a little longer, but uh, it's uh, anyway uh, feasible for an experienced robotic surgeon. So you see uh, that we move on on uh, this research uh, letter that uh, represents uh, the first description of a uh, 
uh, versus prostatectomy that uh, we actually try to uh, reproduce. And here you see uh, other uh, technical refinement that we try to add to our Hugo Ross experience, particularly the four arms were coming with a tilting angle that was not that much useful to manage the seminal vesicles. So we change a little bit from the original description and now we are much, much more um, confident that we can manage it. The other thing that I know that verses don't like me to show, but uh, it's very important for me, is the use of the monopolar energy with a foot pedal. This uh, make my life much easier compared to the past because I had some issues using the energy with my right thumb. So I'm much happier like that. So I don't know. This is my personal uh, adaptation to this technique, of course, is not that much allowed from CMR, but this is what I decided to do. You see here the console time at the very beginning, uh, Ugo Ras took a little longer than co compared to the 85 minutes that we use for with Da Vinci, but at the end of the eight case, we are more or less on our average time, whereas on the CMR, this uh, approach take a little longer, but still we have to do more cases to understand more. Same thing for pelvic node dissection, only two cases, but we just dropped to 37 minutes. And uh, since we felt pretty confident, we moved to the radical cystectomy with Ugo. And I think that this is absolutely great. Uh, very, very nice case to do with, uh, with Ugo because the anatomy, just let me show these uh, uh, images. You see the details of the anatomy of the umbilical arteries and vesicle artery are absolutely great. It's very, very good quality of the image, as we said. Also, the consult time for a cystectomy was more or less acceptable. So very, very briefly, I'll go to the end. Our educational and training experience, this is an evaluation of factors impacting on uh, basic robotic uh, skills at the Yugo Ras simulators. It was 71 participators that made uh, a test with a pick and place exercise with the Yugo Ras. What we tried to see if the um, trainees uh, were medical uh, students, residents, laparoscopists and robotic surgeons, how the experience in training changed using the simulator. And what we found is that the time to complete the click and place exercise was significantly lower among prior robotic surgeons compared to both naive and laparoscopists. This means that transferring the competencies of robotic surgery is good uh, when we move from Da Vinci to um, Ugo Ras uh, more than for both naive and laparoscopists. The other thing that was pretty interesting to me was that neither gender nor video game use significantly correlated with the metrics that we found. And of course, I want to thank my assistant, Chiara Siginolfi, who uh, developed the study that was uh, that is on the publication of European Neurology Open Side. So robotic surgical skills in the end are seemingly transferable across platforms. And uh, of course, the introduction of these novel simulators probably can be a matter of attractiveness to uh, young guys. And you see, they're very enthusiastic to use this new platform. In conclusion, we can say that robotic assisted radical prostatectomy is a treatment of choice of organ confined prostate cancer. New robotic platforms are emerging, such as the Ugoras and Versus. And of course, even if scattered at the moment, preliminary series support the feasibility of robotic prostatectomy with new robotic system without major drawbacks, at least in our experience. And robotic surgical skills, when you get it, are seemingly transferable across system. The development of a multi-platform training program will be the challenge of a few decades. Of course, we don't have the single port, but none can have it in, in Europe at the moment. Further studies are required to spread new technologies and further explore their effectiveness and cost. With that, I would like to thank very much you again and Alberto for this uh, webinar that I hope that you enjoy. I don't know if you have just a few uh, minutes for the final questions. Alberto, I don't know if you have some. Well, there are. <clears throat> thank you, Bernardo. Great, uh, great talk as usual. Uh, there are a couple of questions um, from the audience, and I think uh, um, we should address it. Um, and the first one is, uh, um, uh, why did you stop? What altered uh, Medtronic, alerted Medtronic? What was the problem? Um, and the problem was uh, that, as always, when you begin uh, with a new instrument and with a new robotic system, uh, there are failures of the system. Um, I still remember when I started at UCLA, the intuitive had failures uh, with, uh, with, the, with the Caesars uh, back in 2002. And now we're, we had the same thing. We had failures with the Caesars. So they would, would break without alerting you. Um, 
no harm to the patient, nothing happened, but because that would happen uh, both uh, to me and to Alex Mutri, um, the Medtronic uh, uh, engineers uh, decided uh, to uh, stop, review the mistake, uh, and uh, get better uh, in what they were doing. And in fact, it took almost uh, four months uh, to get new scissors uh, uh, and to, to get the new um, uh, hardware, so then uh, uh, this mistake uh, is not happening any longer. This error is not happening any, any longer. So for this reason, we had to stop. Um, and uh, and I think that's important. And again, uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that the system is, is not good. In fact, now they are selling many systems uh, and it's working appropriate, properly. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that we both, uh, Alex and I, were the pioneers with the two, two new systems. Uh, and so, of course, uh, we would have expected something like that to happen. Um, um, can uh, you answer this question? Maybe, uh, Bernardo, may uh, we ask about the cost of the Yugo platform? I think that uh, at the moment it's very hard to give a reply on this question because uh, uh, the number of systems that are placed uh, are pretty limited. And so I think that the policy of uh, cost and uh, the cost of the disposable instruments is something that has to be dealt with uh, every center that try to approach this uh, novel novel technology. The feeling we have is that at the moment is much cheaper than the uh, would say existing other technologies. So I would consider it. For us, it is twenty percent cheaper. Um, we calculated this, uh, and um, and it's twenty percent cheaper. So again, uh, cheaper doesn't mean better. Cheaper means uh, that for your administration, uh, it will be more convenient. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I think it's a it's a very nice system, as I said. But uh, in the end, uh, you'll have to try it. Um, and uh, there is another question, maybe for you, uh, Bernardo, or for both. But uh, if you have the chance, first of all, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, if you have the chance. Uh, uh, of buying just one system in a hospital with no robotic system yet, what would you, would be your first choice? <laughs> That's a difficult, very good question. Diff difficult question. <laughs> this is a difficult question. Well, uh, I think that we can uh, give an answer to this question only with a clear uh, data regarding the, um, the costs. So depending how, how is the deal between the company and uh, the hospital. If the price is the same, honestly, I would still prefer the XI. If there is a reduction in the price, I think that Hugo is absolutely a great machine. At the moment, I think that Versus still needs to be improved a little bit to be competitive with the other two. What do you think? No, I totally agree. I think that, you know, that's a difficult question. But uh, in general, I would say, listen, Intuitive has been there for over 20 years. Uh, they have uh, the fifth generation machine. They have a perfect machine. So there is no doubt that uh, if you buy Intuitive, uh, you you perform the right choice. Uh, with any other company coming in the market right now, you are facing uh, the first generation robots. Uh, and therefore, you have to get ready to um, have some issues. If you're lucky, you don't. But if you are not lucky, you may have some issues like we had at the very beginning of our experience. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, you know, uh, I think that right now, uh, intuitive come first. And then if you have the intu intuitive system and you want to expand your robotic program uh, with cheaper instruments, uh, then of course, uh, the companies, uh, uh, new companies are here to help us. Nicely, there is another question on a Senhans surgical system, ex transenterics, and uh, I think it's uh, it's nice. Do we have any experience with the system comparable to all tonight mentioned systems? Do we have experience of that with the Senhans? No, but uh, um, well, this is this is. I think that the Senhans is not for urology, um, and um, I I've never used it. But uh, listen, it has been there for quite a. F a long time now and 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 uh, and as you see there's uh, there's no robot uh, available uh, no data available very few little little data available in neurology as opposed to cm to medtronic where in less than 6 months we already have uh, 10 15 papers out uh, and uh, already in italy i think they sold the 10 or 15 robots and in europe uh, they have already sold 40 or 45 robots so 
um, I don't know if I answered you, but that's a quite uh, an easy well, answer. I, I had a, um, a very limited experience in a dry lab, and my feeling is that, of course, still has to grow up a little bit to be uh, competitive with the other system. And nicely, this comes not from Transenterics, but from uh, originally from Sofar. That is an Italian company that did great because it was a uh, ahead of uh, many other systems, but the, the project still has to be more mature. CMR, in another question, say that versus concepts come from laparoscopy. In your study, I guess mine, not yet published, you have shown that laparoscopy did not do better. What do you think? Actually, the study is not on versus, but the study is on uh, Ugoras. So uh, we found basically that in the Ugoras uh, uh, metrics of one exercise, it doesn't mean to not to have an advantage when you go clinically or surgically in a real patient. It's just a matter of uh, metrics in handling in a simulation. The simulation and the surgery are two different things. You don't have to think that the best in the simulation skills who get the best uh, outcome uh, is uh, necessarily also the best that once start doing the surgery can uh, perform the best surgery. I think at least that uh, this is my point of view. What do you think about? No, no, I agree um, um, uh, totally what you said. Uh, no, no doubts. Uh, but I would like to to add since the time is moving on and we need to finish uh, just uh, a little comment and I'll give you the word uh, to close this uh, beautiful seminar. Um, and it is that Irus. Uh, uh, the, the section of robotic surgery, um, which I represent and Bernardo is working uh, with me in the board, uh, um, is working very hard uh, because we have a very, very um, uh, challenging job now. You see that uh, Intuitive is there with three platforms, uh, the SI, the, or actually four, the SI, the X, the XI, and the SP. Now there is CMR. Now we will have Medtronic. We have Medtronic with the Ugo. I can tell you that the J&J is coming. Uh, Medicaroid is coming. Uh, um, uh, Avatera is already there. So there are at least eight companies uh, that within the next two years, uh, they will have uh, platforms uh, in the market. So you will hear more and more of hospitals acquiring different platforms. And now the question is how to train robotic surgeons uh, to be used to use uh, all the, these platforms, uh, provided the fact that, again, you have an example with Bernardo here. He has three different platforms in his uh, in his hospital. And sooner or later, his administration will say, listen, the CMR is cheaper. So, Bernardo, you have to use CMR and not intuitive. Intuitive, use it only for private patients um, or something like that. So, or maybe the companies will lower the price. But that's the challenge of the future, how to train people. At Orsi with Alex Motri, uh, we, are, we, are, we are training people in three, four different platforms right now. We have the CC Irus uh, that will have to be implemented with these new companies coming in. Um, and so only the future will tell us if we are right or wrong. But the big challenge, remember this, is how to train people. So Alberto, there are many, many things to see, to show, particularly in the next future. So I think that we can conclude with... Uh, maybe your invitation uh, to the next uh, EROS meeting, if you can tell us when it will be uh, and where, we will be very happy, I think, to join uh, the meeting with uh, these uh, novel messages and uh, with great life, care, life surgery. Well, thank you, Bernardo. Yes, of course. Uh, I hope to see you, first of all, at the EAU in Milan, where you will uh, have the opportunity to share many knowledge about robotic surgery and many other things, but also to invite you to the IRUS uh, in Florence. This year, Andrea Minervini uh, will be the host at Careggi Hospital. There is a phenomenal program already on, the go, on, on its go. Um, and it's going to be 13, 15 of September 2023. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you also to EAU. Sorry for being late, but uh, there were many interesting contents. So thank you very much for being with us up to now. And uh, see you soon in Milan first and in Florence afterwards. Thank you. Have a good thank night. You.